my name is Robert Zimmern. Uh, I'm a senior engineer at Martin Arena Astronauts in Denver. And um, I'm going to give a talk uh, today uh, not about uh, how to go to Mars or colonize Mars. I am going to give a talk on that subject tomorrow. What I hope to address here, rather, is why we have to go to Mars. Uh, and so uh, the title of my talk is the significance of Martian currents here. And um, you'll understand in a moment why I chose that particular ponderous title. Uh, I'm going to be talking a lot of history, and I have to apologize uh, to uh, our Canadian hosts uh, that uh, most of the historical analogies I'm going to use are coming from American history. Uh, that, uh, despite the fact that many of them would also hold very well for Canada, and this is simply due to the fact that as an American I'm more familiar with American history, but I, I believe that there is an entirely analogous uh, story to be told of. Okay. Now, uh, the story here, I'm going to talk about past history and I'm going to talk about future history. Okay? And I'm going to start out in 1893. Next slide. Okay? In 1893, a remarkable event occurred uh, in a very unlikely place, which is to say the annual meeting of the American Historical Association, which I believe was somewhere in the Midwest that year. And uh, this is a, a meeting of the history professors. Uh, so it, it's usually not, not that big a thriller. And on, it was a Wall Street conference. And um, on Thursday night, which is say the fourth night of the conference, an evening session, which is not the place to be if you want to hear your paper, the last paper of the night uh, was given by an obscure young professor from the University of Wisconsin, which university had only been around 20 or 30 years at that time, it was not considered a prestigious place to be from, um, gave a paper. Uh, and uh, for some reason, um, a few people actually showed up, including some people who later became fairly important, like Winter Wilson, Theodore Rosa, and others, uh, to hear what this uh, young fellow had to say. Uh, and the man's name was Frederick Jackson Turner. Uh, and he gave a thesis, a paper, which he called The Significance of the Frontier in American History. And this paper was a bombshell. Uh, because what Turner got up and said was, he says, look, what is the, the source of this democratic, humanistic, progress-oriented kind of civilization we have here in America? Is it precedence in Anglo-Saxon law, no, okay, he showed that that was so, and it certainly wasn't Anglo-Saxon racial stock as some other historians at the time were arguing, uh, or, or it wasn't legal precedence or theories by John Jay and Alexander Hamilton, other of the founding fathers in the United States, he says, no, it was the existence of the frontier, okay, that conditioned the entire process, okay, and uh, here's what he said. He says, to the frontier, the American intellect owes its striking characteristics. This is a quote from, from Turner's original paper. He says, that a uh, course of strength combined with acuteness and inquisitiveness, that practical inventive turn of mind, quick to find expedients, that masterful grasp of material things, lacking in the artistic, but powerful to effect great ends, that restless, nervous energy, that dominant individualism, working for good and evil, and with all that buoyancy and exuberance that comes from freedom. These are the traits of the frontier, or traits called out elsewhere because of the existence of the frontier. Since the days when the fleets of Columbus sailed into the waters of the New World, America has been another name for opportunity, and the people of the United States have taken their tone from the incessant expansion which has not only been open, but which has even been forced <coughs> upon them. He would be a rash prophet who should assert that the expansive character of the American life has now entirely ceased. Remember, the papers 1893. In 1890, the census declared the frontier closed. It wasn't really, but the line of settlement that had always defined the furthermost existence of Western expansion had actually met the line of settlement coming east from California so that there was no uh, further uh, limit uh, anymore in the sense that it had existed for the previous 100 years. This was a remarkable event. Movement has been its 
dominant fact, and unless the training has no effect upon the people, the American energy will definitely <coughs> demand a wider field for its exercise. But never again will such gifts of free lands offer themselves. For a moment, at the frontier, the bonds of customs are broken and unrestrained is triumphant. There is not time to harass it. The stubborn American environment is there with its imperious summons to accept its conditions. The inherited ways of doing things are also there, and yet, in spite of the environment and in spite of custom, each frontier did indeed furnish a new opportunity, a gate of escape from the bondage of the past, and freshness and confidence and scorn of older society, in patience of its restraints and its ideas, and indifference to its lessons, have accompanied the frontier. What the Mediterranean Sea was to the Greeks, breaking the bonds of custom, offering new experiences, calling out new institutions and activities, that and more of the ever retreating frontier has been to the United States directly and to the nations of Europe more remotely. And now, four centuries from the discovery of America, at the end of 100 years of life under the Constitution, the frontier has gone. Okay? And with its going, has closed the first period of American history. Next to the chart. The basic point okay, is that the whole philosophical outlook which underlay the basis of a democratic and humanistic society was created by the frontier. Illustration. Okay, the frontier creates an incredible labor shortage, both at the frontier and back east, because the factory worker back east okay, always has an out. Even if he doesn't exercise, he has the out of going west. Okay? He has the out of quitting. This does a lot. Okay? The labor shortage drives up pay. It creates a tremendous drive for the creation of labor-saving machinery and technological innovation in order to resolve this problem. The labor shortage and the ability to quit creates a re-estimation of the dignity and the worth of the common man. Okay? Because he has to be treated as someone who can quit. Okay? He has to be treated with consideration. He is not a serf. Okay? He can take a hike. And the uh, ability of American workers to basically tell their bosses to shut it, uh, which would not exist in a more European or, or Oriental uh, <coughs> setup, uh, where they have a tribal relationship to a, an employer or, or, or uh, stems from this. But also, this drive for innovation, to try to find constantly a better way of doing things, not accepting a given way of doing things. This is all uh, the source of, of, of uh, it stems from the frontier. The belief, okay, that people actually define their environment. In other words, in America, especially during the 19th century, when cities were rapidly being built all over the place, there were people who understood that Chicago was something that wasn't there 30 years ago, that they had built it, okay? And that America itself was not something that you lived in, it was something that we were making. And that people were not simply the inhabitants of the world, they are the makers of the world, okay? And that, once again, changes your entire view of what people are, okay? And this all uh, stemmed from this existence of this open frontier. Next slide. So, the bottom line question that Turner himself asked uh, in uh, 1893 was, with the end of the frontier, what is going to happen to this? What's going to happen to this sort of society? Uh, and uh, can you actually preserve a free and innovative society in the absence of room to grow? And as you can see from the quote uh, itself, Turner himself said, well, look, this isn't going to go away immediately just because the Hawaiian settlement disappeared in the last census. Okay? We have 400 years of character development based upon the frontier behind us. And that is going to have a certain momentum. And the habits of thinking that's based upon that are not going to go away overnight. But what he went on to say, he said, it will erode, okay, it will disappear. And what we're going to move towards if we don't have a frontier is an increasingly static and bureaucratized form of society in which existing ways of doing things become enthroned and, in fact, protected by various um, regulatory authorities and, and, and uh, other situations. So, well, ha has that um, come to pass? Let's see the next slide. Okay, <laughs> uh, the America without the frontier. Uh, there is a tremendous loss of vigor evident in American society relative to 
uh, 19th century society. Uh, bureaucratization is, is massive. There are now regulatory structures for governing virtually all aspects of, of public, private, and commercial life. Uh, in an incredible array of, of government uh, agencies or anything you can think of. Uh, there is also an increasing lack of, of uh, ability of political institutions to carry off great projects. Um, I, frankly, I could not believe the current American political structure being able to carry off the Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, the, uh, it would be absolutely impossible. Uh, the uh, cancerous proliferation of regulations affecting all aspects of life. Uh, society, uh, well, seeks to protect itself from itself. Various regulations that you can cite, um, they all have rationales of that with various degrees of merit. Um, I don't have a problem with a law that says I have to wear a seatbelt, except does there really have to be a law to tell me that I can't work, that I have to wear a seatbelt? Does there really have to be a law that says that lawn darts are illegal? That, you know, if you can go down the list on this, there are laws for all sorts of things, uh, and the more laws there are, the more uh, difficult it becomes to do anything. Um, the I recently tried to start a small business in the state of Colorado, and there were 20 regulatory agencies whose conditions I had to satisfy uh, in order to uh, do this uh, uh, business, uh, and it, it becomes difficult. Uh, the spread of irrationalism, uh, as people did see less and less of a connection between uh, action and, and effect. Uh, loss of willingness by individuals and institutions to take risks, economic stagnation and decline, I would argue, I mean look, well, I don't have to argue, the fact of the matter is, is that living standards stopped going up in the United States uh, in the early 1970s and have been flat since that time, and that is the first period in American history in which that has been true, over anything like that length of time. Uh, the, uh, uh, a uh, massive deceleration in the rate of technological progress. There are people here that might think that that is an outrageous statement given the array of, of new types of consumer gadgets that one sees in stores every Christmas, but as I will show, the rate of technological progress that uh, is, is currently occurring in the Western world is drastically slower than uh, what was going on uh, in the United States and the Western world more generally uh, from the 1700s through the 1960s. Uh, the, uh, and a loss of belief in the idea of progress itself. Uh, and in other words, the characteristic uh, American belief and Western belief more generally, although uh, American in, in a certain sense represents the most skilled form of this, is the idea that change is a positive thing, that progress is possible, that the world and human society and social conditions can be improved, that history is not cyclical and it's not static that we can constantly improve things. Uh, there, there is an increasingly uh, uh, dominant uh, view coming into the fore that uh, progress is in fact a, a danger and, and represents a threat to uh, proper uh, life. Uh, and these are all symptoms of, to put the, in one word, a decadent society. Okay? It is all symptoms of a society that, that has, has become unhealthy and is heading uh, towards a downward trajectory. Uh, so, next slide. Okay. In other words, we need a frontier. <clears throat> that is, and the reason why we need a frontier is social. That is, those people who say, look, you space people, um, you're, you're very inconsiderate. You're talking about launching rockets to the moon when we have all these massive social problems. Okay. They have it all wrong. The, the, the most pressing social need that exists in American society and Western society more generally right now is for a frontier. The problems that we have are overwhelmingly being caused because of a lack of a frontier. The, now, where can you open up a frontier at this point in history? And there's a number of suggestions here. Okay. Um, two of them are terrestrial, perhaps in the unsettled zones of Antarctica or under or on the oceans. Well, there's no question that it would be easier to build a colony in Antarctica or under the ocean or on the ocean on floating barges 
than it is to build one on the moon or Mars. But the fact of the matter is, is that they won't cut it at this point in history. Because the essential feature that is needed for a place to function as a frontier is that it's a place where you are free of the hold of old institutions, which are defining what you can and cannot do. And putting the matter very simply is with modern means of transportation, anywhere on the surface of the earth, the comps are too close. <laughs> That's all there is to it. In other words, existing laws and regulations affecting what you're allowed to do can be enforced anywhere on the globe by existing terrestrial authorities. And that prevents the development of new social forms and even the implementations of new technologies. Um, and therefore, they won't work. They don't solve the problem. Now, there is the question of the moon or orbiting space colonies uh, in the uh, O'Neill model. And while there is no question that it is more likely in the near term that you could construct a, a settlement or an outpost, rather, that could produce some sort of economic return uh, on the moon or in orbit than you can on Mars, the problem, and you could certainly construct a scientific outpost on the moon that would return various forms of interesting astronomical science and other science, there are no resources there to support civilization. On the moon, okay, there's oxygen, but it's in the form of rock. And there is no carbon, there is no hydrogen, there is no nitrogen other than in parts per million quantities. If you took seeds to the moon, you could grow plants in a greenhouse, but essentially every atom of carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen that would go into those plants would have to be imported from off planet. Okay, if, if the moon, I mean, people talk about hydrogen on the moon, but you gotta understand this, if there were concrete on the moon, lunar colonists would mine it to get the water out. That's how dry the moon is, okay? And orbiting colonies, there is no mass there at all other than what we bring to that point. So, while these are interesting places to build various forms of space industry or scientific basis, they are not places in which you can develop a civilization. And, and that is what is required. The next slide. Okay. Now, Mars, on the contrary, does have the requisite uh, materials. Uh, there, it is far enough away from Earth to, to free its colonists from terrestrial domination, intellectual, legal, and otherwise, so that they can actually develop a new kind of society. Okay. And it is rich enough in resources to support a civilization. There is water on Mars. There is water on Mars frozen into the soil as permafrost. There is so much water on Mars that if Mars was smooth and that water was melted, the planet would be under 200 meters of water. Now that is dry compared to the Earth. If the Earth was smooth, we'd be under 2,000 meters of water. But that is comparable to the amount of water there is on Earth on land. Okay. And in other words, it's certainly enough to support a biosphere. There's carbon dioxide, gas in the atmosphere, there's carbon, there's oxygen. Nitrogen is the minority constituent in the atmosphere. And the soil is rich in all the phosphorus and sulfur and silicon and titanium and aluminum and iron and everything you could want uh, to support both life and technological civilization. So the, in short, Mars is the place okay, uh, within this solar system that is most readily susceptible to be the ground upon which a new civilization grows. Next slide. Okay. And I won't go into it now, I'll go into it at late tomorrow, but we right now have all the technology we need to send humans to Mars. Okay? We could send humans to Mars within 10 years if the money was turned on today. We are more prepared to send humans to Mars right now than we were to send astronauts to the moon in 1961. Okay? And we made it for eight years from there. Okay? And I can discuss exactly how that can be done. The essential basis is if you don't try to construct gigantic interplanetary space liners to take you to Mars, you send relatively small payloads to Mars and you return them with propellant that you make on Mars. You learn how to use Martian resources. That's what you need to do in order to have a, a travel light and live off the land uh, kind of Mars mission that we can actually pull off. And that's what you need in order to establish a settlement on Mars. Because all the raw materials are there to support life and civilization on, on Mars. The only question of whether you can have a civilization there is not one of transportation, it's one of your ability to use those resources and transform them into useful goods. The, uh, now, the fact of the matter is, as we'll discuss at length in a panel this afternoon, that not only can we send people to Mars and have them live on Mars, Mars can be transformed. Mars was once a warm and wet planet. 
you know, thick CO2 atmosphere that allowed liquid water to exist on the surface. That's why there are giant riverbeds on Mars that took periods of geologic time to create. And Mars can be made a warm and wet planet again because the reserves of CO2 required to create a thick atmosphere on Mars are still there. Uh, and with exponentially rising technological capabilities applied to this problem, uh, massive alterations to the Martian environment can be done by humanity in the course of the 21st century. Okay? And we can talk more about that. But what the bottom line here is, is the fact is that Mars can be settled, it can be transformed, and this defines it as a new world that can create the basis for a new branch of human civilization. Okay? And the purpose of that branch of civilization is not to provide a happy home for the tiny minority of humanity that actually gets to emigrate there. I mean, that's nice if it, it, it can do that, but that's not its function, is that without such a new branch of human civilization, terrestrial civilization will cease to exist as a progressive civilization. Um, because without a laboratory in which new things can be tested and new things tried out, things will, will stagnate. Okay? And the Earth has ceased to be a place that provides such a laboratory in which human activity is unconstrained. Next slide. Okay. The bottom line is, why do we need Mars? Okay? It's because Western humanist culture, widely bad mouthed by politically correct media, okay, but nevertheless, by far the most, uh, the best culture for allowing the development of human faculties that humanity has yet produced is going to be wiped out if the frontier remains closed. Now what do I mean by a humanist society? Okay, I mean a society in which human beings are valued and that human rights and human life are held precious beyond price. Now, the sacred rights of man, uh, the sacred value of human life, uh, those notions have existed philosophically within the Judeo-Christian tradition for several thousand years and, and represent the core values of Western civilization. Uh, but they could not and were not implemented as a practical basis for organizing human society until the opening of the great frontier uh, by the much derided uh, Christopher Columbus um, at the close of, of the uh, 15th century. Uh, next slide. See, the problem, before Columbus, you had this thing in Europe, uh, a rather unimpressive civilization, which called itself Christendom. Okay? And um, the problem with Christendom was that it was fixed, it was a static society, and everything in it was owned. The problem wasn't that resources were rare. The problem wasn't that there wasn't vacant land in Europe, because there were. Europe was not heavily populated in, in the 14, 1300s. Okay? There were big forests in Europe, but someone owned all of them. Okay? There were ruling institutions in Europe that controlled everything there was in Europe. The, uh, and what you had, and every one there was in Europe, okay, was controlled by one or another of these institutions. And what, what Europe basically was like, was like a, a play in which there were only so many parts, there was a leading part, a leading male, leading female, and so on and so forth, key supporting roles, there was a chorus, you could be assigned to one of these parts, and that was your part, and if you didn't get that one of those parts, you had no part at all. Okay? Now, what happened was, by opening up the new world, what was created was kind of like an improvisational theater, okay, in which people were actors who could define their own roles, who could write their own script, who could define their own world. The, uh, and this unleashed incredible amounts of creative energies, and all sorts of new things could, could be tried out. Next slide. Okay. See, what, what the New World did is, first of all, it allowed the development of incredible types of cultural diversity by allowing escape from institutions that were informing, you know, imposing uniformity. Okay? It allowed progress by escaping the whole of institutions whose continued rule required continued stagnation, intellectual, technological, otherwise. 
It, it drove progress by creating a situation in which innovation to maximize the capability of the limited population available was desperately needed. Okay? Popular education in Massachusetts in the 1600s was the best in the world, by far. Okay? The, there, the, the, you had literacy there okay, close to 90%, and not only in English, but in Latin as well. Okay? The, uh, because what you had was you had a society which had to maximize the, the value, the labor power of every citizen in it. Okay? You could not afford to have people, uh, if you could avoid it in any way, be uneducated drudges capable of very limited activity. The, and you wanted to constantly introduce a new and better way of doing something, whereas in Europe, uh, and even more so in the Orient, when you had a surplus of population, uh, there was no particular reason at any point to try to, to uh, introduce a superior method of technological uh, production or organization. Okay? And it raised the dignity of man by raising the price of labor and demonstrating, okay, for all to see, that common people could do amazing things. You read all these books by European travelers in America in the 1700s, French aristocrats commenting on you know, the common American farmer saying, it's remarkable that peasants do these incredible things. Uh, I, I never thought that you know, people who, who were not aristocrats could do these incredible things, but, but they do. Um, and it, it set an example. And it, and it showed that people actually create their world. They're not defined by it. Okay, next slide. Now, what happens now, okay? What will the 20th century be like without a Martian frontier? Well, there's one point that's very clear. There's without a new frontier in space, human diversity is gonna decline severely. This is obvious, it's apparent, you can see it right now. That is, with 20th century modes of global transportation, jet aircraft, global communications, etc., cetera, uh, the world is becoming a smaller and smaller place and human diversity will erode. Regional diversity, uh, international diversity, there's no way you can stop this. This is happening. Okay? So that the uh, Earth terrestrial culture will become increasingly uh, of one sort. And this is bad. It's very bad because multitudes of cultures means there's multitudes of ways of thinking. Okay? Multitudes of ways of addressing essential problems that will present to human species. And when you have a multitude of ways, you are more likely to have someone who gets on the right way. Uh, this is why variation in species is very important. Uh, it represents the health of, of the species. The more varieties it has, uh, the more likely that species is going to survive. It's a law of biology and it's a law of human society as well. Now, there's another point. Without the new frontier, uh, I believe we face the risk of technological stagnation. Now, I have here a picture to illustrate this point of a B-52 farmer. Now, the B-52 bomber is still the premier bomber in the United States Air Force, okay? The first one was built in 1950, 44 years ago, okay? They're still the dominant bomber in the U.S. Air Force. 44 years before 1950, may I have the next slide? This was the state of aviation, okay? So in 44 years, we went from that to the B-52. In the following 44 years, we stayed with the B-52. Okay? I flew here to Toronto in an aircraft not substantially different from aircraft uh, that were flying in 1963. Civilian uh, commercial airliners, essentially similar to the Boeing 727s that went into service in 1963, 30 years ago. 30 years before 1963, the state of aviation was the DC-3. 30 years before that, it was uh, the right flyer. Okay, once again, 1930, 1903, right flyer. 1933, DC-3. 1963, Boeing 727s. 1993, Boeing 727s, or 47s, which are basically large models of 727s. There is absolute stagnation going on in aviation. This is even true in military aviation, in jet fighters. F-4 Phantoms, which went into service in the early 60s, flew for the United States in the Gulf War. Okay. Now, there were more advanced fighters that flew too, but it's remarkable that a good pilot in an F-4, a 30-year-old airplane, can still defeat a bad pilot flying an F-16. Okay. That would not be true of a pilot in an F-4 in 1963 fighting a pilot who was flying the best plane the 1930s had to offer. Okay. The, uh, there is stagnation going on. You look at our rocketry. 
The rockets we're flying today are no different from those that we were flying in the 1960s. Okay? And in fact, our actual space capability today is inferior to that that existed in 1969. Okay? The, I mean, if, if the progress of aviation represented by the transition from the Wright Flyer to the B-52 had considered in the, continued in the following 44 years, uh, this is what our, our current aviation would look like. <laughs> That is, if you look at the technological vector that we were on in the first half of the 20th century, and even more so, actually, in the 19th century, where the transformation was even more dramatic, uh, and you, you look at it actually, for the most part, coming to a screeching halt uh, sometime around the late 1960s. Uh, we have had major technological innovations uh, that were coming online in the 1960s that have failed to come into general practice. The most notable example being nuclear power. Okay? An extremely important technology based to the processes of production which has been aborted. Fusion power, which would have been more advanced than that, should have been coming into existence by now had the progress in, in energy development that was going on in the 20th century continued. It has not and remains a prospect for the far distant future at this point, becoming father and father as the um, drive towards technological solutions to energy uh, becomes weaker and weaker and less determined. Uh, and basically, uh, all sorts of technological products. I mean, okay, we have right now uh, a new technology emerging, biotechnology, new, new forms of, of crops created by biotechnology. And some of these innovations are actually being allowed to reach the market. But it's becoming more and more difficult. Okay? it's becoming more and more difficult because there are more and more regulatory structures being imposed that say, can you assure us that this new technology won't create some sort of threat to the environment, or to people, or to public health, or whatever? It would be impossible right now, okay, if the Wright brothers had not invented aviation, okay, if someone had invented it now, it would have been impossible to create aviation in the United States in the regulatory and insurance environment that exists as it now stands. And in fact, uh, that environment is driving general aviation out of business in the United States, uh, even though it's already been developed. Um, the, now, next slide. Well, in a frontier society, on the other hand, you don't have people telling you, well, first of all, you don't have people telling you you can't do anything. Okay? And second of all, you have a tremendous incentive if you have a better way of doing something to implement it. You don't have people telling you you can't do it that way because you need to do it that way. Okay? In 19th century America, even at the frontier, this is, this is Nebraska you're looking at in the upper left hand corner in the, in the 1870s, and they are doing harvesting with steam powered tractors. Okay? In Europe at that time, it was still being done by stoop labor, labor with, with pests. Okay? The, and, Larger and larger, larger, more advanced machinery being introduced at the 1876 World's Fair you're looking at there. Okay? And the pride of the nation with this advanced technology. On Mars, okay, if you had a Martian colony and someone invents a new strain of crop that will double yield to the greenhouse, there, anybody who says, well, I don't know, I don't think we can do this, it's not natural to engineer a plan, is going to be thrown out the airlock. Okay? <laughs> the, uh, that's all there is to it. The, uh, if on Mars, Okay. You won't have anyone saying, what do we need fusion power for? We have plenty of coal, and furthermore, incidentally, the dominant financial institutions of this society happen to own it, and we would really like to continue selling it, okay. the, which has been the fundamental problem blocking the introduction of nuclear power, solar power, fusion power, you name it. Okay. This, the, we have an array of existing institutions which have existing interests in an existing way of doing things, and they don't have to conspire to stop a new technology. They simply have to withhold their support, okay, their political support, and even simply their financial investment that's required to move forward. The, there are other things. Next slide. Okay. On Mars, you're going to have I mean, a labor shortage like you won't believe. Okay. There is going to be nothing rarer on Mars than human labor power. Nothing more scarce, nothing more precious. Not water, not uranium, labor power. Okay? You're not going to want to have, if you had a Biosphere 2 on Mars, there is no way you would tolerate 
uh, it being organized in such a way that its inhabitants would have to spend uh, the majority of their waking hours growing plants. The, the system would be completely automated and the most clever innovations would be brought to bear in order to reduce any form of wasted labor because it's totally precious. Okay? This also existed on, on the frontier. Uh, where, as I said, you have this drive for labor saving machinery, you have a drive for public education, and you have a drive for something else, which is to use every person to their fullest potential. You see these pictures here of Colorado schoolhouses in the 1860s. Okay? Now, oh wait, well, there's a couple of things you notice about these schoolhouses. First of all, the fact that there are kids in them, of common people. Second, the children are boys and girls in the same classroom. Okay? And the teacher is a woman. Right? Now, you may not think that's significant. A woman who adopts a career as a school teacher is not thought today as some kind of feminist icebreaker. Okay? But the fact of the matter is, is women were not always teachers. They were not always allowed to be teachers. The woman as the school teacher, the school mark, okay, came into existence on the American frontier. Because if you had a person who was literate, who was capable of teaching school, you could not deny her that job because she was needed. Labor was needed. And the phenomena of female school teachers originated on the frontier and then propagated east became dominant in the US during the Civil War when the men went off. But it was proven on the frontier. Women could teach school, they did teach school, and of course they still do teach school. And the, this was in fact the first, um, what you might call, good professional career that became open to women uh, in, in anywhere in the world. Uh, and in society, uh, the first intellectual career that uh, became open to large numbers of women, other than very exceptional women authors and so on. And other people, okay, you know, um, in the 1950s, if somebody made a movie about the old West, all the cowboys were white. Okay? Now recently, due to the political correctness denying, we start to see some black cowboys. And it is probably the case that the only reason why you're seeing them is because of the current fashion. But however, it is true. Okay? There were lots of black cowboys. On many sections of the American West, 25% of cowboys were black. Okay? A lot of prospectors were black. Okay. A lot of prospectors were Chinese. Not all Chinese who came over here to work on the railroad. A lot of them were prospectors. A lot of them opened up Chinese restaurants. The, <laughs> the, the, the fact, because there was no one who could tell them that they couldn't do it. Okay? And so, especially on the frontier, if you could do something, you could do it. Okay? The, um, and, of course, immigrants were uh, urged to come here. They were financed to come here, even sometimes paid to come here to help out, to add their labor power, to add their capabilities uh, to, to the growth of, 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 of civilization in North America. Now, today, with the frontier closed, we no longer feel we have a labor shortage, and in fact, immigrants are not welcome. Uh, and in fact, to, uh, well, basically, I'll tell you something. Uh, you can argue about immigration policy, but I feel personally, that there's only a small step between not valuing new people to not valuing the people you already have. That's, that's what I think. And, and that's the danger that you're facing. And you can talk about how you might address that okay, due to the problem that you have and that you don't have the labor shortage. But nevertheless, that is the bottom line here. Uh, okay, on Mars, on the other hand, labor will be as rare as it possibly can. Nothing will be more precious than labor time. It means pay is going to be very high on Mars. Okay? Uh, and workers will be treated better. And public education will be driven much harder than ever has been the case in human history on Earth. Because you're going to want to have a quality of person on Mars that is higher than we have accepted as the average quality within any society that has existed on Earth up till this time. And so in other words, what, you, what I'm saying is Mars will set a new standard a higher standard, okay? because the standards we have now, while better than those of medieval Europe or you know, the ancient Orient, are not the ultimate. We have not reached the ultimate state of development of human society. And if we're going to go forward, we need a place where a higher example is set, much as a higher example is set in regard to previous models in the uh, North American frontier. Uh, next slide. Now, question of democracy. Uh, the 
Frontier, according to Turner, and I think he was right, drove the creation of real democracy in America. Uh, well, first of all, as long as the frontier was open, you always had new fortunes being created by new people. It, it was impossible to create a closed aristocracy of power. Okay? But there's more to it, is that you create a, a, a very self-reliant population which would insist on the right to self-government, which knew it had the right to self-government because it knew that it was the people who were creating the country. They were not simply people who were here and trying to fit in somehow. Okay? The, uh, and, uh, while the trappings of democracy still exist in abundance in the United States and other countries uh, today, uh, I would have to say, um, um, while I'm not experienced in the Canadian uh, situation, I would have to say in regard to America, the content has disappeared. Uh, we have a Congress which is elected with a higher degree of reliability than the Nazi Reichstag. And that's a fact. Uh, the, uh, or any other uh, totalitarian Congress. Um, we have, um, basically, you used to have in the United States a political party substructure which involved meetings in local halls in which people would get together and debate policy and it would filter up through the system and become the policy of the party. That ward structure, that clubhouse structure, no longer exists. And basically, being a Democrat or a Republican in the United States today has the same content as being a Yankee fan. They are a Rams fan. I'm a Republican fan. Okay. I'm ten minutes. Sir. I started ten minutes late. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, the um, lunch will be in Venus, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, you excuse lunch me. Tickets. It's in Venus, not Libra. There has been a change in the lunch room. It is in Venus where lunch was yesterday. Okay. Um. The, uh, uh, there is no actual organic connection between the population and political institutions. They're offered candidates who they have essentially no role in choosing, and they're offered a set of policies that they really have very little input on. And uh, basically speaking, uh, the, the electoral process in the United States at least has become mostly a, a spectator sport. Uh, we become a fan of some particular faction and you throw your vote in. Uh, and I, I do not believe that democracy can be sustained by people who view history as a spectator sport, who do not understand that people make history. Now, and um, so on. Next slide. Now, in fact, there is a much greater threat to human society in the absence of the frontier than the decay of democratic institutions into oligarchical ones. Uh, and that is, uh, without a frontier, you get the threat of the propagation of what I call closed world ideologies. Uh, the most uh, obvious example is the Malthus theory, which is the theory that uh, resources are finite. So basically, as population grows, you increasingly challenge finite resources, uh, and that unless population growth is limited or reversed, uh, living standards will decline, perhaps catastrophically, uh, because there's only so much to go around. Now, this point of view, uh, is totally false scientifically because resources are not finite. Resources do not exist other than as creations of human beings. And the more people there are, the more creative minds are acting, the more resources are created. And this is why human standards of living historically have gone up as the world's population has gone up, not the reverse. Okay? The, and that is a fact. And that, that is a fact that at every single point in human history, Okay, increasing population has resulted in increasing standards of living and not the reverse. However, to a person who is living in a society with a closed frontier, the Malthus theory appears to be self-evidently true. And this is a, a very dangerous thing. Because if you believe in this theory, then every other person in the world is a competitor with you for scarce resources. Every other person in the world is your enemy. Okay? And then the only question becomes, how do you organize yourself to deal with that problem, okay? And historically, it has been tyrannical regimes of one sort or another, either uh, regimes where a, a totalitarian superstructure suppresses its own population, or where uh, races are organized to exterminate what are considered to be enemy races, competing with them for the scarce resources of Mother Earth, a la Nazi Germany, okay? And the, it, it's only, <coughs> 
and a world of infinite resources, and where resources are understood to be infinite, that, that all men can be brothers. The next slide. So, in other words, if, if we don't have an open frontier, the prospect is very real of humanity uh, creating hell for itself in the 21st century, um, as we're already seeing in certain localities on Earth uh, today. Uh, and then there is the question of humanity's own notion of its own worth. Okay? And basically the question is, are we the makers of our world, or are we just in its inhabitants? Are we people who have the right to change the world? There is an ideology propagated today that human beings are just visitors on the earth, and we have no right to change it. We don't have the right to turn swamps and jungles into farmland, which 19th century people thought were their sacred duty, improving creation, carrying on God's work in doing so. Uh, and thus, uh, uh, an example of the, uh, as they would put it, the divine nature of the human spirit. Okay? Today, that is viewed as an affront okay, upon Mother Nature, which is held to be above humanity, okay, in, in basically a, a, a pagan point of view. Uh, now, in a society that's growing into a frontier, uh, the creative role of human beings is self-evident. And in no case would this be more profoundly true than in the case of transforming a dead planet like Mars into a living one. Because there you're not merely altering the biosphere from one form into another that is more acceptable to supporting human life and society, uh, but you are actually creating biosphere itself. Um, next slide. Now here's some uh, interesting quotes. Uh, the uh, and since time is running short, I'll, I'll, I'll skip the first and I'll read the second. This is from a book by Walter Prescott Webb called The Great Frontier. Webb was a historian who was a follower of Peter, and he actually generalized Perna's thesis from simply the American experience to the global experience of the birth of Western civilization uh, out of Christendom and the opening of, of, of the larger frontier in the New World. He said, it'd be very interesting to speculate on what the human imagination is going to do in a frontierless world where it must seek its inspiration in uniformity rather than variety, in sameness rather than contrast, in safety rather than peril, in probing the harmless nuances of the known rather than the thundering uncertain of unknown seas or continents. The dreamers, the poets, and the philosophers are, after all, but instruments which make vocal and articulate the hopes and aspirations and the fears of the people. The people are going to miss the frontier more than words can express. For four centuries, they heard its call, listened to its promises, and bet their lives and fortunes on its outcome. It calls no more. Next one. So, to conclude, uh, what I'm saying is that Western human civilization, as we know and value it today, was born in an expansion, grew an expansion, and can only exist in an expansion dynamic mode. Now, I'm not saying that civilization will cease or the human race will go extinct if we don't have a new frontier. No, I don't think that's true at all. Okay? But what I am saying is that while human society would persist in a non-expansive world, that society will not feature freedom, creativity, individuality, or progress, and placing no value on those aspects of humanity that differentiate us from animals, it will place no value on human rights or human life. And while that may appear to be an outrageous statement, the fact of the matter is, is that except for the last 400 years of Western civilization, that is the basis upon which all human societies have been organized to date in all human history around the world. That is, unless we want this little period of, of, of you know, progress since the Renaissance to be viewed as like a, a little golden age, a footnote in human history, or you know, perhaps a favorite period of future historians, kind of like the golden age of Greece, this was really neat, and then they went away. Uh, okay. We have to have a new frontier. Uh, the, uh, now, and Mars is the place, and it's just the first place. It's the first leap into a process of opening an infinite frontier. You see, because look, you open up Mars, and okay, you terraform Mars, Okay, and you have a period in which there is large-scale free integration into Mars. Okay, that period will, I mean, if you have a civilization on Mars, you will have a tremendous drive in there for the development of interplanetary transportation. Uh, very rapidly, Mars will be settled, and uh, it will become close to Earth in terms of transportation and so forth, and it will eventually re-emerge with terrestrial culture. It will cease to exist as a frontier. 
And that's true. So saying, gee, are we simply extending the existence of humanist civilization another 200 years, perhaps? Well, no, because the same technologies that make Mars close, you develop fusion propulsion for interplanetary spacecraft, so forth, that bring Mars into the terrestrial sphere eventually and make it cease to function as a new frontier branch society. Those same technologies gives you a marginal capability for settling Titan or the outer solar system. And when you settle Titan, Okay, that would be a strong driver for transportation systems okay, that can get you to Titan in three months instead of a year and a half. Okay? And those kinds of advanced propulsion systems will give you a marginal capability for interstellar travel. And so it goes, that each step in the development of human society okay, gives you a lease on life in which to continue this exponentially growing rate of technological progress that exists in society where people are free to create. Okay? And that, in turn, gives you the, the extra capability needed to reach out and take the next step to open up another frontier, which extends your time still more and extends your reach still more. Okay? But the key thing is not to let the process stop. Okay? Because if it stops, what you're going to have is society crystallize into static forms that are inimical to the resumption of progress. Okay? And, and I believe that is what defines the present age as one of crisis in that we still have a lot of remnants of the frontier age. We still have a lot of the intellectual traditions of the frontier age. There's still a lot of people who remember that progress is possible, that improved technology actually can improve standards of living and not the reverse. Okay? But yet we do see the first signs of, of crystallization, uh, more than the first, clearly visible. Uh, and so if we go on, okay, Without opening up Mars, the crystallization will continue. The old, uh, the gift from the past that this knowledge of the idea of progress will fade, and 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 we'll lose it. But as I said, we, we, we still have the greatest gift of the past 100 years, which is our capability to initiate a new renaissance and a new frontier by opening up Mars. But if we don't do that, I don't think we'll have the capacity anymore. Thanks. to try to encapsulate 
the real reason why we support space exploration. Right? I sometimes hear space advocates get up in front of audiences they're attempting to convince and say, the reason why you should support space is because uh, we'll learn about the Earth from space and we can have communication satellites and spin-off technologies and various other uh, contributions to our national economy. But I think that there is almost no one who actually really supports space who came to that point of view because they woke up one morning and said, I think it's really important that the gross national product be increased and I, I feel that the way to do that is to have more satellites. The, no, it's because people feel the need um, for a frontier and what it means uh, in terms of new possibilities for them and for their children and for society at large. And they feel that there's something unhealthy going on with, with that not being there. And that's why I believe almost everyone that really supports space supports it. And if you want to convince someone else okay, to support space, that's really where you have to come from. And you have to be not ashamed or afraid to bring that forward because that is the only real reason. Because we don't really need communication satellites. I mean, we don't need them. You can have telephones, you can have fiber optics, you can duplicate their capability with anything. Okay? You don't even need observational uh, environmental satellites, although you know they do something and it's nice, but you could do that from the ground or from the air or from balloons. The, the, it's just something that's not the purpose of the space age. It's just something that the space age happens with made possible. Uh, the, and this is the real reason, and this is what we have to fight for, four square and straight on. Yeah. Um, to, to try to give another answer, or, or a supplementary answer to the question, why have we given up? I think one of the reasons why is that we, that, that somehow the space communities and the space industry community lost touch with and lost the artists, the humanists, the writers, the, the generators of culture. Almost, I mean, with, with a couple of exceptions, I mean, in filmmaking, there are still people who are deeply friendly to getting into space. In, um, in science, science fiction, clearly there are people who are deeply friendly to going in, into space. But to a large extent, um, sort of academic humanist writers, uh, artists, and so on, are hostile to the idea, deeply hostile to the idea. And they're hostile to the idea, I think partly it goes back a long time, but I think at, 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 one, at a certain point in the development of the space program, sort of there was this, the, the, I think that the space program felt that it didn't want to be associated with flaky, kind of touchy-feely artists, and so, put them at, ar at, at, at arm's reach. And then there are all kinds of political differences increase the breach. And it seems to me that one of, the, one of the big things that needs to be done is that that breach needs to be healed. There has to be a real rapprochement. There has to be a real change. I, I agree. And um, you know, it goes back to a, a book that was written around 1960 by C.P. Snow called yeah. Two Cultures of the division of our society, which on one hand, technological culture that still believes in progress and kind of engineer's point of view, okay, and the liberal arts culture, which uh, takes a cynical and existential view towards the idea of progress and how these two parts have ceased to communicate. And uh, basically, with, uh, without the support of that liberal arts culture and liberally educated population, the technological culture becomes increasingly impotent to accomplish anything other than defense programs of the most extreme immediate necessity. But I feel that the language that both cultures can understand is that of history. And I feel actually that it is very useful for more people in the space movement to educate themselves about history because the real reason why we have to go into space is historical. It's not technological. The technolo technological stuff is just means to the end. Okay? It's the historical reason that, that we are going to fail historically if we don't do it. And I think it would be very useful for more and more people to make it their business to understand more about history and be able to argue more about history. Um, given that there's no incentive for existing institutions to fund something that's going to uh, weaken their grasp or weaken their ability to regulate, there's no reason for this government 
made it possible for people to escape its grasp. Yeah. Or I don't see that they would that they would think so. What I'm wondering is what can we do to get this exploration of Mars funded? Because I don't see any government paying for people to escape from. <laughs> okay, no, and of course this was a, a problem that, that was settled in between America and Britain um, by force. Um, but the but often the fact that it has to, that there is this dichotomy is not apparent to the uh, parent government until the progress has gone along certain ways, and that's fortunate. Uh, the uh, so I, I don't re result, regard that as an insoluble paradox. It's shown frequently it's possible for governments to create colonies that ultimately uh, they they lose control. Uh, although they don't understand that at the beginning. Uh, I do feel that um, it would be very useful to have ways to support space exploration that do not require uh, government support. Uh, I am circulating a proposal right now uh, to the NSS Policy Committee and elsewhere uh, for um, an initiative that I feel will contribute to that. I'll just mention it briefly. Um, it's an idea of um, for a space mining, and it's illustrative of an approach that could be taken on other things as well. The idea here is this. What if you have a law passed that said that any private consortium that funds oh, an asteroid probe, for example, with their own money, that goes out and images an asteroid, or perhaps a section of the moon or a se section of Mars, to a certain degree of fidelity, say, one meter in pixel photographic resolution plus a gamma ray spectrometer chemical assessment, that they would get the patent, the rights, 20% of the material imported from that piece of real estate at any time in the future, 100 years from now, 300 years, it doesn't matter, okay? They have the patent on that, okay? They own 20% of the cash value, okay? If they do it with a lander that does an in situ chemical survey, 40%. If they do it with a sample return mission, 70%. If they do it with a human exploration, 100%. And of course, we're talking about a lander on Mars, we're not talking about all of Mars, but rights to it in some defined radius of the landing site, okay? The, now what would that do? Okay. Even though nobody right now is prepared to actually import platinum from an asteroid or helium from the moon, the fact is there are people who would be willing to bet on the come that at some time in the future that will be a practical endeavor. And what that means is that the rights to that have cash value today. Okay. Have cash value right now. And what that means is that the mission can be financed right now. Okay. And it also means that if Newmont Mining or Peabody Coal or somebody like this goes out and funds an asteroid probe for $100 million, which is what it costs to make that money, so that kind of money is clearly within their means, okay? And they develop a bunch of, of, of patent rights which have speculative values up to tens of billions of dollars, who knows? Okay. They're going to want to, or whoever ends up buying those uh, instruments, are going to want to do whatever they can to accelerate the development of space technology. They want to develop advanced propulsion, and so on. They're going to become a lobby. This actually is very similar to the process that settled North America, where the king sold rights to land to big speculative combinations, huge tracts of land beyond the Appalachians, land that had no immediate probability of seeing a plow run for 50 or 100 years. And yet those people would buy those rights. And then they would then trade those rights, sell them to smaller speculators, subsections at an increased price. And those people would then fund pioneers or surveyors like George Washington, for example, funded to go beyond the Appalachians and do surveys and find land in Kentucky that were within these domains that were particularly amenable to agriculture. So they'd come back with a report and then try to induce uh, perhaps a rich individual to buy that and finance a group of settlers to go there. And of course, at each step along the way, the value cash value of the land per acre would be elevated, okay? And the process would go up. And at each step along the way, as more and more private interests were created that had an interest in furthering this process, You'd have a bigger and bigger lobby community that would urge the Crown to build roads west, to garrison the area, to uh, pacify the Indians, and so on and so forth. The point is that uh, if you had uh, such a legal instrument in place, okay, uh, a great deal of space development could be privately funded, up to and including the colonization of Mars and the legislation was there. Bob, you realize the National Space Society I happen to be your representative in the United Nations. 
for you. And we are very actively working on a very legal instrument of which you are speaking, namely the modification of the 1979 Lunar Treaty. So we are pursuing, and the National Space Society is out front as a non-governmental organization, doing the very economic steps that you have just mentioned. We thank you very much, and I'd like to give you a copy of the book. Thanks. I guess that closes it because I think it's lunchtime.